uh, I'm a student of GDS, will be the moderator of the session. Uh, I formally welcome uh, our, you know, our chair, chairperson, uh, chairperson and uh, the um, uh, professor, professor, uh, professor Dr. Sara Shahid from the Department of Psychology. She's, uh, uh, she will, uh, say, say, you know, uh, she will chair the session today. Uh, and nowadays, she is in former Christian College. She did PhD in Applied Psychology from University of the Punjab, uh, Lahore. She did MSc in Health Psychology from University of Surrey. Uh, UK and MPhil in Psychology from National Institute of Psychology, Kadyazam, uh, University of Islamabad. Uh, her last appointment before joining FCCU was a director of Rutfa Women Institute of Leadership and uh, um, Leadership and Learning, chairperson of Gender and Development Studies, and professor of Applied Psychology at LCWU. She was awarded the Best University Teacher Award in 2014. Uh, she is also an FCO SAS scholarship holder. She has been the project director of an HEC funded project. She was also the principal investigator coordinator for a three year Pakistan US University partnership with George Washington University USA. Uh, she is a member of the Chancellor's Committee for the smooth running of the University of Narwhal Punjab Mental Health. Authority, Executive Committee of Pakistan, U.S. Alumni Network, Lahore, Health Mutation Evaluation Committee of Shokat Khanum Memorial Cancer Hospital. Uh, she has been a member of the Board of Governors and Executive Committee of Punjab Daycare Fund Society for many years. She is the author of an internationally published book, Urban Women in Pakistan, Exploration in Health Psychology, and a number of research articles is an eminent researcher and has published a lot in national and international journals. I uh, warmly welcome you, ma'am, in today's session. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, what is going to be the format, Marian? Format of the session? Uh, Ma'am, uh, I will uh, call upon the presenters uh, first of all, then at the end you will give the, uh, you know, uh, remarks, including remarks regarding this. All right. Uh, question answer, uh, I will let you know that um, please uh, make sure about it that the question answer session will be taken at the end of the session and uh, every participant will take, uh, will um, have only five minutes, uh, uh, five to eight minutes maximum. Uh, so our first presenter is Sundas Fatma. Her research is on Great self stigmatization in young obese women living in Lahore. So kindly continue. Aslam Likum. Aslam Likum. My name is Sulis Papa. Are you going to share your, uh, you know, your research presentation? Or should I? Ma'am, my slides, ma'am. Ma'am, Mariam Patul share the PMA slides. Okay. Ms. Fatma, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Let's start, please. Okay, ma'am. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Sundas Fatma, and I am from the Hall College from Women University, Lahore. And my paper presentation topic is Made Self Stigmatization in Young Obese Women Living in Lahore. First of all, we come to the introduction. When we meet obese people, should we cause them annoying glance of concern and ask, How are you doing? Should we send flowers and get well soon cards to obese family members and friends. Fatty individuals are blessed with negative implications. Dissimilar to condition where the appearance are their undetectable individuals with weight where they're making them extra powerless against CN and classification. Fatness has become an issue for the clinical calling to treat fix and opposite at a person just an aggregate level. The World Health Organization has inferred that the improvement of heftiness relies upon heredity, natural way of life, social conduct, nourishing, and local area elements, and subsequently had figured out how to cooperate nearly all, all that has to do with being human in the public arena as a potential reason for largeness. 
by researching largeness self-cation from a fundamental viewpoint as a social issue situated in a second request to reality where heftiness is reacted to inside a medicalization outline mindfulness can be raised on how designated activities would be able to deliver unforeseen adverse outcome weight self weight stigma weight stigma characterized as antagonist perspectives towards people in view of their abundance body weight that influences relational association at different level internalized weight stigma is simply the degree to which people judge adversely because of their weight by credit to cling conversation about people with overweight and stoutness strangely regardless of overweight and heftiness turning into the standards prominence of weight based separation verbal physical social on the web or experience both weight shame has expanded considerably now come to the objectives to find out weight self stigmatization sorry to find out weight self stigmatization in young obese women married and unmarried to find out difference between weight self stigmatization of married and unmarried obese women literature review the fundamental work of goffman 1963 who characterized shame as any close to home poverty that is profoundly undermining to its honor these traits incorporate ancestral blemish evil entities of the bodies and flow of individual characters the second one is tomiyama cobweb model 2014 he proposed his model to portray how encountering weight disgrace characterized as a stressor prompt weight acquired as well as trouble with weight reduction because of expanded eating conduct and cortisol emission next we come to the hypothesis This is significant. There is significant difference between weight self stigmatization of married and unmarried obese women. Methodology: Quantitative research design was conducted by using survey method. The convenient sampling technique was used. Population of hundred females living in Lahore: fifty married females and fifty unmarried females. The tool was the questionnaire. The weight self stigmatization. Now come to the procedure. in order to conduct the current research permission is taken from the author for using the tool in the study demographic sheet is constructed by the researcher to get the information from the participant regarding her age marital status education income range after getting permission from the institutes and from the authors of scales institutes were visited participants are informed about the main purpose of the study if they are willingly agreed to be a part of the study they are in short regarding their privacy and their right of withdrawal from the study informed consent was distributed among the participant and then they were given the questionnaire for filling the participant need 20 minutes for the for the completion of questionnaire now come to the statistical analysis the data was analyzed so ibm spss version 28 firstly reliability analysis was performed for all the scale used descriptive and descriptive statistic analysis was used for the demographic information of the participants firstly we use independent independent sample t test to find difference between weight self stigmatization in married and unmarried obese women we come to the demographics marital status 50 married and 50 unmarried women age range 15 to 35 68% was unmarried in 21 to 25 range remaining 34% are married and lies at the other age limit ma'am please slide change kar next slide education the maximum married women were educated from the college and university with 86% and maximum of unmarried women with 98% now come to the discussion and results study was conducted to take the weight self stigmatization of obese women living in lahore similar to our study meadows and collegros 2018 investigated that weight self stigmatization of obese women more was more in married women on the other side if lang and 
Aptistin informed that the obese unmarried women having more weight self stigmatization. Now come to the conclusion. In a nutshell, the current study was quantitatively resulted that most of the married women were short maximum of the responses toward the weight self stigmatization behavior toward obese recommendation. The following are the limitations on the basis of conducted outcomes from the proposed study of self stigmatization of married and unmarried obese women. The interpretation of the data was only area concentric or conducted only from women of Lahore. So for this regard, this is one of the limitation. Furthermore, the proper policy should be suggested for those scenarios like health issues to sum up the study would also have carried out from the other areas. But due to pandemic condition, it was conducted only for from online Google form. Due to COVID-19, we just take the limited responses to the to the approachable carriers. Thank you. Sundis, are you there? Are yes, you there? Done. Yes, ma'am, I have done. I have presented. Okay. Okay. Our next presenter is uh, Muniza Bas, and uh, her research uh, paper is on PM 2.5 of smog precursor and its associations with lungs capacity in females. Maniza Bas, are you there? Assalamu alaikum. Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Yes, engineer. Assalamu alaikum, everybody here. I'm Hafiza Sana Yusuf from the Department of Environmental Science, Lahore Poly for Women, University of Lahore. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank and being honored uh, for being part of this conference on first international virtual conference on gender and social sciences diversity, challenges and opportunity. Today, I'm going to present my topic, which is uh, particulate matter 2.5, a smoke precursor and its association with lung spasticity in females. Excuse me, yeah. Please show me the introduction, the slides. Well, coming towards the introduction, as environmental pollution has been a major source of distress due to industrialization and urbanization, which leads to the global problem. Globally, uh, uh, 3.7 million deaths occur due to the ambient air pollution. In Pakistan, air pollution is not only worsened in urban areas, but is much uh, deteriorated in rural areas of Pakistan. The major uh, sources or reason for damaging air quality is the burning of biomass because it emits certain types of harmful products uh, which are in, uh, in, uh, dangerous to health. And uh, among air pollutants, particulate matter, which is known as the inhalable particles, have been a source of concern because it is responsible for 1.4 million deaths from respiratory illness, as well as uh, particulate matter is a major smoke precursor which further deteriorates the air quality. Around 50% of the world's population and uh, almost 90% of the people in poor countries are um, uh, victim of untreated bi uh, biomass fuel.
Well, uh, coming to the national rationally of my study. Hello. The rationally of my study. Hello. Are you listening? Me? Yes, we can hear you. Your voice dropped yes. in between. But right now, yes, we can hear you. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, please come please to the, the next slide. Rationally, rationally of my study. I want to see the slide. Rationally of my study. The rationally of my study. Ma'am, please show me the slide of rationally of my study, please. Yes, yes, thank you, ma'am. The rationally of my study is based on to determine the uh, concentration of particulate matter 2.5 and their effect on the uh, female health and their lung pesties. The next two slides are, uh, the next slide is based on the literature, uh, literature review which provide a strong proof regarding the air pollutant and uh, uh, their, yes ma'am, please come to the literature site, literature review. The literature review uh, provide a strong proof. This is a, a literature review which I have collected from different uh, ethnicity, uh, which shows a, a air pollutant association with the disease. Here are the multiple reviews shows that particulate matter 2.5 has strong association with the respiratory and the lungs disorder. Here you can see particulate matter uh, in different uh, um, uh, studies shows a, a strong relation with uh, lung respiratory or as well as lung disorders. Now the materials and methods of my study. Uh, the, uh, for this study, I have selected Yes, please. Yes, four villages were selected for this purpose with uh, industry Kasur, which were Usman Wala, Nurpur, Kuria Khas, Murali Hidhar. The data was taken from the March and July 2021. The particulate of, uh, matter 2.5 is collected by using a particulate counter instrument, and the health status of a female were assessed through the questionnaire. Lung functions was monitored by spirometer and the peak flow, uh, expiratory flow rate was determined from 200 females, uh, 50 from each sides. Please come to the results. Yes. Um, <clears throat> this result shows the graphical representation, um, which shows um, uh, here, uh, first graph shows the uh, uh, Hello. First graphical presentation is about the mean average monthly uh, particulate matter uh, in different areas and in different months. Uh, if we can see the different uh, uh, particulate matter concentration varies in different areas in different times. Uh, in four sites, the high concentra uh, concentration was found in um, uh, um, Nurpur and lowest in the uh, Kudia cars. Uh, this is due to the uh, type of uh, fuel burning, loose soil, and geographical condition, while Kudia Pass is much more better in geographical condition, and the people, they consume gas and fuel. The other uh, relation, uh, the other is a correlation between the peak exploratory flow rate and the particulate matter concentration. It is a, a positive uh, relation in which it shows, may I please come to the uh, results? Slide, please. We show a positive relation by increasing the particulate matter. Yes, here we can see the second graph, which is a correlation between the particulate matter, monthly average of particulate matter concentration with peak exploratory flow rate, which is um, a positive relation by increasing the particulate matter concentration. The uh, uh, peak exploratory flow rate was also increases. The other correlation is between the particulate matter concentration and humidity, which is a inverse relation. And the fourth one is the correlation of um, uh, particulate matter uh, with the uh, particulate matter with the pressure, which is a uh, uh, correlation with the particulate matter pressure has been uh, varyingly trend through the uh, each month. It shows the negative relation with particulate matter. Uh, this slide shows the uh, uh, diseases that have uh, uh, in, uh, that has come in contact due to the particulate matter. Here we can see this pipe chart uh, graph shows the 
highest portion that is 64 percent of uh, uh, is the uh, respiratory problems contribute respiratory problem and other are the skin infections that have minor fever and sore throats among 64 percent of this graph the respiratory problems the, the respiratory uh, diseases are uh, cough breathing chest problem asthma and um, which uh, includes among uh, respiratory problems the these are the respiratory uh, problems which uh, contributes a big part. So this shows uh, a particular metro concentration uh, found a, a strong relation with the lungs disorders. Then come to the conclusion. Females are exposed to multi-health and safety hazards. It is concluded that particulate matter have various impacts on the uh, female health. The health status of female was not good because they had fever, skin issues, and respiratory problems. The lung function was low in most of the female due to the high level of the particulate matter 2.5. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hafsa Sana Yusuf. Uh, now our third participant is... Uh, Presenter is Anab Shehzadi. Uh, her research paper is on mind, mindfulness as a predictor of mental health in female university students of different faculties. Uh, Anab Shehzadi, how are you doing? Anam Chizadi, are you there? I think so she has not joined yet. So I will uh, like to call on uh, our uh, the fourth presenter. Uh, the Nazi, uh, she is Nazia Asmut, Nazi Asmut, and her research article is on uh, disease-related discrimination, uh, religious uh, coping strategies, and quality of life among HIV patients. Ms. Nazia Asmut. Yes, Nazia Smith, are you there? I think that still she is not there. Uh, our next participant is uh, Sijil Shehbaz. But are you there, Sijil Shehbaz? Sijil Shebaz, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, I can't hear. I can't hear you. Uh, are you there? I think that there is some issue with your mic. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, we can't see uh, listen you kindly. Uh, Okay, there's some issue with your own uh, microphone. Manur Shebas, but are you there? Siji, we can't hear you. I think so. We can speak later on. Uh, we will go forward. Uh, Mahnoor Shehbaz Bhatt, are you there? Mahnoor Shehbaz Bhatt. Manu? Manu Shebas. Okay, I will go forward. Uh, the Yeba Zia. Yeba Zia, are you there? Oh, yes, I am here. Can you hear me? 
I welcome you here. Um, and her research paper is Impact of COVID 19 Pandemic on Maternal Health Service in Kasu. Can you share your slide? I want to share my slide by my own. Yeah, you have. Because we don't have, we didn't receive that. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much, first of all, uh, for this platform where I'm going to present my work. Uh, before starting my presentation, I want to introduce myself. I am the Yaga. I'm doing PhD in public management from Yanshan University, China. And I'm also a lecturer of sociology in Government College, Kasu. Uh, in this research, my professor, my doctoral tutor, and uh, my mentor, Dr. Li Pang Fan from Yanshan University, China, has been for that. My topic of work is impact of COVID 19 pandemic on maternal health services in Kasu, Pakistan. So, uh, uh, throughout the world, as health system were being prepared to deal with the COVID pandemic, which will affect the. Tayyabla, could you please get closer to the mic, please? Okay. Your can voice you hear me now? Good. I can hear you, but the voice quality is not good. I think there would be some signal issues. Okay. Is that fine now? Can you speak a little bit loudly? Uh, loudly. Okay, yeah. I, would, I would speak loudly. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you. Uh, throughout the world, this health system were being prepared to deal with the COVID pandemic, which will affect the administration of health issues like diabetes, mental health, and mainly maternal health care system. And all efforts are focused on understanding the pandemic its clinical feature, transmission uh, patterns, and management of COVID are restricted. There has been very little concern expressed over the effect on maternal health services, so they may cause situation with worsen maternal mortality in urban and rural areas. So there was, this situation requires government and NGOs to make necessary arrangements and uh, um, to uh, support people in this uh, uh, outbreak. So uh, there I wrote that outbreak of coronavirus affects the life of the people so everybody knows about it. While efforts have been made to combat the disease, one major source of concern has been exponential effect on the delivery and utilization of maternal care services in the country. So this study's goal was to look into how COVID pandemic and related lockdowns affected the provision of uh, reproductive maternal services in healthcare facilities across the city, which included in uh, SDG 3 sustainable development goal. As far as uh, pandemic policies on maternal uh, health policies is considered, WHO issued guidelines to help manage perinatal, prenatal care during the COVID pandemic and recommended at least eight prenatal visits for low risk women. However, it was observed that fewer visits in developing or other underdeveloped world are associated. WHO also uh, and other healthcare agencies also suggested that continuing vaccination uh, programs without any further delay because of its vital role in prenatal care to pre prevent maternal mortality. But it was seen that government did not devise any plan to continuously provide prenatal care during this emergency. Uh, the COVID pandemic has also seriously affected the availability of pregnancy of pregnancy related medicine, vitamins, and iron, the missing of important vitamin sources like folic acid that results in the fetal uh, abnormalities. So there is a need of evidence-based knowledge for administrators and policymakers for sustainable development goal three, development for the world, and this uh, goal aspire health and well-being for all and access to quality maternal health services also included in its targets. Um, as concerned Pakistan, the maternal mortality rate was almost twice as high in rural areas as compared to urban areas. 
high mortality uh, for maternal mortality has largely been attributed to a few remote maternal health center and a lack of properly trained staff. During this outbreak, it became more challenging for the rural population to assess maternal health care facility due to consistent lockdowns, redeployment of physicians and other paramedics to uh, quarantine centers and isolation wards and the lack of public transportation in all over Pakistan. So this study will uh, shed light on the uh, healthcare services with a special focus on gender-based health service, that is um, maternity uh, health services, which are also included in our uh, sustainable development goals. Um, uh, as far as the research question, uh, if part, uh, 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 the research question was to investigate the impact of COVID pandemic on maternal health services in Kasur, which leads to the status of gender health and well being in Kasur. Uh, major review uh, in the major review focused on uh, issues faced by maternal and prenatal health care services provided due to pandemic in developing nations globally. So, according to the World Health Organization Maternal Mortality Estimation Survey, which conducted in the fifth year, estimated the maternal mortality rate is highest for Asia, and it is seven, even uh, higher for South Asian countries, including Pakistan. Um, as per most recent states, uh, uh, around two nine five thousand women die during and following childbirth worldwide in a year. South Asia alone accounts for almost one fifth of all these deaths. It is regrettable to note that. Uh, 94% of maternal deaths occur in underdeveloped countries. A most recent survey naming Pakistan Maternal Mortality Survey 2019 conducted by a National Institute of Population Studies funded by USAID showed considerable demographic variation in maternal mortality rate of women rising in rural and urban areas of Pakistan. And Pakistan basically ranks, ranks fifth in the world according to population. So, uh, it's an agriculture-based economy, and recent state shows that 64% of the Pakistani population who, uh, lives in rural areas. So, according to the this study and this report, a nationwide maternal mortality survey in Pakistan is MMR is 186, and uh, uh, the report also indicated a considerable increase in uh, incidence of maternal death in rural areas of Pakistan. Um, maternal mortality ratio for urban areas of Pakistan is 158, while on the other hand, uh, in the rural areas 199, uh, it is imperative to provide mothers in order to avoid these complications with skill, care, and safety during pregnancy, childbirth, and postnatal period. Uh, various other contributing factors also include like poverty, lack of education, gender based inequalities, uh, malnutrition, violence, unfair. Uh, distribution of resources, political environment that it would be termed as key indicator for increased maternal death burden in rural areas. Uh, moreover, having the Millennium Development Goal failed, now Pakistan is lagging far behind in achieving sustainable goals. Uh, the means of unmade sustainable development include a reduction in child death, uh, improvement in maternal health, and a greater number of births by skilled personnel. Uh, as we talk about this, week, City of South of Lahore in the Pakistani province of Punjab. Uh, city serves as the headquarter of the two district and its 24th largest city of Pakistan by population. Uh, it has 641 villages. Uh, uh, as per census of 2017, urban people are 25%, rural are 75%. Uh, so, the district of Sur has a widely issued hospital, both and two, from which only one in the Sur city. Uh, 20 rural uh, health centers in rural districts, only three in the city. So, uh, basic health units and uh, civilian dispensaries. There are very small number of private hospitals and maternity health centers, and uh, they are not uh, enough for local people. Uh, 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 in rural areas of Kasur, traditional birth attendants still continues to conduct deliveries, and uh, they have not from uh, formal training in maternal care during pregnancy or delivery of baby. Uh, so they are uh, so trusted by rural communities because of their experience and their time and age of maternity as an occupation. Uh, however, their antenatal and postnatal care concept, hygiene and uh, birthing equipment are always uh, are shown to be inadequate and related to maternal complications during and after 
the children. So, uh, ecology in this, uh, so there are some concepts I use on fact of COVID and maternal mortality rate uh, uh, to any loss of women's life resulting from pregnancy, complication, or death within 40 days after childbirth, not notwithstanding the period side of the pregnancy, relating from issues that are linked by the management of pregnancy, but not from uh, accident or incidental factors. Uh, maternity health services include the health of women during pregnancy, childbirth, and postnatal period. Each state should be a positive experience, ensuring women and their babies reach their full potential for health and well -being. So, other concepts also defined in the paper. Uh, methodology uh, was the quantitative in nature, cross sectional research design. A questionnaire was developed to assess the impact of uh, matern uh, maternal and prenatal health center and their activities and service delivery from May to July 2020. Study population was uh, the questionnaire was distributed among 300 representatives for random sampling techniques represented of total 10 public and private hospitals uh, and three rural health center of Kashmir from Surya Khas, Mustafabad, and Kashmir City were selected. A brief explanation of the study purpose and assurance of anonymity uh, was outlined on the first page of the questionnaire informed consent for the pain from all the spent responded before data collection and the interpretation of data was done using quantitative analysis and uh, SPS. The data uh, collection uh, and data analysis, the final version of survey questionnaire included 60 data questions for specific question for antenatal service and 30 for postnatal services. Questionnaire was approved by the Ethics uh, Committee of uh, Public Management Department of the Anshan University and uh, given their approval number. Uh, question was divided in uh, four uh, categories. First, central characteristics. Secondly, service visit and, and examination. Thirdly, transfer, uh, transformation into a dedicated coverage facility and uh, staff. Fourthly, financial relief from government, relief from international agencies, protective measures at health center. Uh, the data collection is processed by SPSS and response category and score was given. Uh, this is the show of my research. Uh, age of respondent at 77% at health care facilities completed the survey because of COVID and other lockdown issues. Uh, and uh, Service visits and examinations uh, uh, are also given with and uh, shown with uh, shows with uh, diagrams and uh, pandemic effect. Uh, availability of personal personal protective equipment. Only two percent of the hospital staff responded reported the availability of guns. Within Kasus, the highest percentage was fifteen percent in public hospital while health center had no guns. Gloves were available only in eighteen percent of the health center. Most of the community. 90% had, uh, had sanitizer, highest percentage was reported in Kuku City, while the lowest was in Surya Khas and Mutababa. A temperature ch checker was available in 94% uh, percent of the facility. Um, the relief during pandemic relief provided by local government during COVID and uh, reception about UN agencies and other development banks relief. Key findings as per sample characteristic results, unless otherwise specific, did not get again significant difference uh, between private and public hospitals and community-based facilities, geographical areas of anti-mental and post-mental care. 76% of respondents strongly agree that the maternity service are affected by COVID. Only 28% of the facilities continue to provide outpatient uh, routine visits and uh, and examination as needed. 19% provided visits, but to a limited extent, while 50% ceased their activities. However, the majority of maternal and prenatal facilities were available for emergency. 42% responded believe that government did not provide any uh, sufficient relief to the health department, especially for maternity uh, services. About, uh, about a quarter of uh, maternal or prenatal healthcare facilities were uh, partially converted and transferred uh, into COVID units to provide care and support to the large number of. Uh, so our survey provides over insight into prescription care and treatment for prenatal patients, that is pregnant women, new mothers, and other caregivers. And that uh, data revealing that the pandemic has caused disruption with uh, delays, reduction, or cancellation in both maternal and uh, mental appointments. 
uh, regarding ticket and examination, although it is fully understandable that non urgent surgeries such as many routine outpatient visits were cancelled in well, uh, which is effort to contain the spread of the coronavirus, but it affects the, uh, the psychological health of the uh, and overall minority of physicians reported that some of other staff members and 3.9% uh, were transferred to COVID wards. Uh, so they are all... Uh, Tayeba, your time is almost done. Yes. Over. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, I will go for the conclusion. Uh, respondent of the public health delivery system to the COVID pandemic is negatively affecting both the provision and utilization of maternal and child uh, care services. So it is deterred to the progress achieved in maternal and child uh, parameter, child health parameters over the years. So better response strategy should be put uh, in place. Uh, it's time for health services to provide to understand the risk of failure, deep themselves with the resources such as uh, digital health facilities, evidence based healthcare. If Implication, uh, centers implication include telemedicine techniques uh, adjust to digital health uh, strategy. Uh, policy maker implications is also their awareness for them should be adopted uh, uh, and transferred into digital health. Uh, for future study, there is a limitation of the study that it is limited to maternity and uh, rural health centers in the uh, General is of the studies limited due to the COVID situation. And situation. Uh, and the study was further delimited to the 10 major hospitals and three billion has thank you very much and uh, thank you very much for your time and your interest. thank you very much uh, our next presenter is uh, sujil shebaz but are you there now uh, yes i'm here i hope you can hear me yeah, yes, I can hear you. Uh, and her presentation topic is uh, Unsung Heroes of Cancer Care, Impact of COVID-19 on Informal Caregivers, Loneliness, Social Support, and Quality of Life. Uh, please continue. All right, I'm just waiting for the slides to show up. Next slide. Can you see? Not yet. I, I just see them being shared, but I don't see them on the screen. Yet. Okay. Okay. I think that there's some uh, your network issue. You can't see the slides yet. Okay, I see them now. Thank you so much. So as mentioned, yes. uh, my topic is Unsung Heroes of Cancer Care, Impact of COVID-19 on Informal Cancer Caregivers, Loneliness, Social Support and Quality of Life. So as we know, the pandemic has affected over 388 million people across the globe, claiming approximately 29,420 deaths just in Pakistan. And it has been a paralyzing contrast at the turn of a new decade. As we all know, COVID-19 has generated a public health emergency of global proportions, causing governments to impose preventative sanctions, such as schools and business closures, physical distancing, quarantine, shielding, and complete lockdowns. And while these sanctions may have aided to flatten the curve of infections, the curtailment of non-emergency medical services, changes to delivery of healthcare and social care services has egregiously impacted people, especially vulnerable populations such as cancer patients and the caregivers. Globally, cancer is the second leading cause of death and it claims approximately 9.6 million lives every year. Cancer patients have been identified to have a two-fold increased risk of contracting the illness as compared to the average population. And cancer caregivers themselves are an integral part of cancer care because of the demanding need of the job in terms of the full-time trajectory of the illness. And owing to the pandemic, we see a shift in the conventional hospital care system to a home family-centered model during the pandemic, increasing the workload 
and the amount of responsibility for these caregivers. This is impacting them in ways never seen before, such as experiencing loneliness, reduced or absent social support, reduced access to healthcare facilities, and a general slump in the quality of their life. Next slide, please. So if you observe the review of research literature, loneliness and social support is basically described as caregivers feel lonely because they are totally isolated, devoting most of their time caregiving to these individuals, limiting their social interaction for the fear of getting infected themselves. This leaves them in a dire need of social support. And research has shown a strong inverse relationship between perceived social support and loneliness. Indigenous research also purports that informal cancer caregivers have high levels of loneliness, which is particularly true for caregivers in a nuclear family system. And owing to this, a reduction in social support is also evident. Social support in terms of quality of life, their relationship is seen as a media, it's a seen as a mediating construct between quality of life and loneliness. We also see that quality of life is significantly impacted when they are burdened, burdened by the duties they are doing and not interacting with people around them. If we look at loneliness and quality of life, we also observe an inverse relationship. Research purports a negative impact on the quality of life when these caregivers are feeling very lonely. And if we observe gender differences, prior research purports that uh, informal cancer caregivers in terms of women experience more psychological distress, lower levels of social support, and poorer quality of life while other research purports that extreme loneliness and isolation owing to cultural demands imposes women to cater to all the needs and obligations rather than making a choice to care for these cancer patients. Uh, next slide, please. So the objective of this particular research was to identify the relationship between informal cancer caregivers, loneliness and social support to examine any link between their social support and quality of life to explain any relationship between loneliness and quality of life of these informal cancer caregivers and to overall explore the positive and negative impact COVID-19 has had on these caregivers. Our hypothesis proposed that there was a negative relationship between the informal cancer caregivers' loneliness and social support during the pandemic, a positive relationship between the social support and quality of life, a negative relationship between loneliness and quality of life, Females were purported to experience greater loneliness, males were purported to experience greater social support, and females were also purported to experience lower quality of life than male informal cancer caregivers. We also hypothesized that loneliness predicted quality of life. We had two research questions, what was the positive impact COVID-19 pandemic had and what was the negative impact? Since this was a mixed method, uh, next slide please. This was a mixed method research, so it was conducted in two phases. Phase one was a quantitative research, collecting data using standardized questionnaires. Our operational definitions are as follows. An informal cancer caregiver is any relative or friend who is providing unpaid ongoing assistance to the cancer patient without getting anything in return, particularly monetary funds. Loneliness is a subjective feeling of feeling alone. Social support is a variable as the perceived level of support an individual receives from their family, friends, and significant other. And the quality of life for this particular research is defined as the general well-being of caregivers outlining any negative positive features of their lives in terms of their psychological well-being, burden, relationship with healthcare, administration, finances, coping, physical well-being, leisure, social support, and private life. Next slide, please. So our sample consisted of 35 adult informal cancer caregivers, 21 men, 14 women who were 18 years and older, caring for a breast cancer patient who had undergone chemotherapy since the pandemic happened, basically from March 2020. It was, uh, the sample was recruited via snowball sampling. None of these individuals were supposed to have a psychiatric history or terminal health condition of their own. Uh, they must be utilizing one form of electronic medium of communication, and they were supposed to be a part of the research under their own free will. The measures included a demographic information questionnaire, UCLA loneliness scale, multidimensional scale of perceived social support, and the caregiver oncology quality of life questionnaire. Um, I think you missed a slide. One slide before this one, please. Thank you. The second phase was the qualitative research uh, to examine the positive and negative impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
This included participants for adults who were a part of the first phase of the research and volunteered to be a part of the second phase. They were interviewed, uh, including uh, seven open-ended questions. They were asked for feedback in terms of their positive and negative experiences for caregiving during the pandemic. Next slide, please. So in phase one, uh, formalized permission to use the scales was obtained, a pilot study was conducted, participants were recruited through snowball sampling via Google Forms. Their responses were recorded and they were asked if they would like to participate in the second phase. For the second phase, formalized permission was taken uh, on the call during which the interviews were conducted, the interview was recorded, the verbatim words uh, analyzed later to retrieve their themes. Next slide, please. So results of phase one reported that uh, owing to the Pearson correlation matrix, we can see that loneliness and social support was observed to have a significant negative relationship while social support and quality of life had a significant positive relationship as we had purported and loneliness and quality of life had a significant negative relationship. Next slide, please. An independent sample t-test revealed that no gender differences were observed between all the variables who were studied. However, in terms of the regression analysis, we observed that loneliness predicted quality of life. And it was also highlighted that family structure also predicted quality of life. In terms of our phase two research, which was qualitatively analyzing the themes, five major themes were uh, uh, retrieved with sub themes, including rewards for caregiving that had prayers, bonding, feeling privilege, religiosity, increment, source of help and gratitude. While patient facilitation highlighted sub themes of availability, increased assistance and understanding of needs. COVID-19 specific caregiving stresses were also highlighted in terms of fear of infection, guilt, social distancing, feeling helpless and increased levels of stress. Obstacles of caregiving in pandemic included inaccessibility to healthcare workers, financial problems, lack of support, irresponsible visitation. And lastly, detriments of caregiving in the pandemic included exhaustion, isolation, neglected health, and feeling trapped. Next slide, please. So if we are to discuss the overall findings, this research examined the positive and negative impact of the COVID-19 pandemic for caregivers. Uh, if we observe a hypothesis, a negative relationship between loneliness and social support was observed in it, which it was in line with previous findings. We also observed a positive relationship between social support and uh, quality of life, confirming a hypothesis, and an inverse relationship between loneliness and quality of life was also observed. In COVID-19, particularly, the increased burden and reduced social support led to a lower quality of life. No gender differences were observed, and this is primarily attributed to the fact that irrespective of gender, all caregivers were subjected to the same restrictions and impositions, experiencing identical life situations equitably, hence having no gender differences. Additional findings highlighted that family structure also predicted quality of life. Uh, previous slide, please. Uh, we also observed that... Uh, the family structure was causing this. Nuclear family systems were not as supportive because of lesser people. We also observed that informal cancer caregivers receive greater social support as the stage of cancer increase, which is in line with previous findings. Next slide, please. Qualitative data revealed that caregivers felt rewarded, which is supported by previous research findings. They felt a closer bond with their patients. Uh, patient facilitation was also seen as the pandemic supports the stance that with the change of healthcare system from hospital to home-based system, policies aided in the facilitation that caregivers could aid their patients. Uh, COVID-19 specific stresses are in line with current research findings. Uh, research revealed that caregivers reported helplessness and increased fear because of virus contraction in spite of taking several measures to secure themselves. Um, Moreover, other obstacles such as inaccessibility to healthcare workers, lack of support, irresponsible visitation, all added to the increased problems these individuals experience. Irresponsible visitation is particularly rooted in the concept of ayadat uh, for our country. Caregiver detriments include exhaustion, isolation, feeling trapped. Uh, this is also attributed to you know, uh, the home-based care along with socially distanced lifestyles that these caregivers start feeling drained. They uh, feel sorry to interrupt, Sajil. Kindly, uh, quickly uh, wind up uh, because your time is over now. 
So conclusively, the current research contributes to, the, to developing greater insight into the positive and negative impact of COVID-19 pandemic on these informal cancer caregivers. Thank you so much for your time and listening to my presentation. Cecilia Shehbazbar. Uh, now, next presenter is our uh, Mahanur Shehbazbar. Are you there, Mahanur? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. And her okay. research... Is it possible that I can share my slides? Yes, yes, yes. It's much better. Okay. Great. Uh, Topic is what home interaction, stress and coping strategies of university teachers during COVID-19. Uh, Ma'am, is it possible that I share my screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you can share by yourself. Um, it, says that the part, it says that you uh, yes, have, I have not allowed. Okay. Yes, I, I, I will give you the okay. You can share. Okay. Perfect. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can see you. Perfect. So when we talk about work home, my topic, um, I'm Manu Shabazz, but from Beacon House National University. So my topic is work home interaction, stress and coping strategies of university teachers during COVID-19. So first of all, as we all know that there was COVID-19 and because of which on 20th March 2020, all the institutions were closed, which actually proposed as a challenge to all the teachers basically to switch their teaching mode to online teaching. However, high stress level was experienced by the teachers as majority did not have the facilities for the technology while even having the technological uh, devices and everything, the mode of teaching was completely different. Hence, there was also a work home interaction which was going on, which actually helped few teachers. However, it also contributed to stress. So we are going to uh, talk about how work home interaction and coping strategies together have helped the stress or it has basically um, increased the stress or decreased the stress. So the relationship, however, when we see the research and everything, there was a relationship between stress and years of teaching experience, female teachers having significantly higher stress than male teachers and hour of teaching as a contributing factor to our stress. So first of all, let's talk about what exactly work home interaction is. Work home interaction is basically, um, it's basically bi-directional interaction between work and home. It has two types of qualities, positive work home interaction and negative work home interaction. However, Concluded, conclusively, it has four categories, positive work to home interaction, negative work to home interaction, positive work um, home to work interaction and negative home to work interaction. However, in the light of work home uh, resource, uh, resource model and job demand resource model during the pandemic stress and negative work home interaction can be due to the imbalance between the demands and the resources. Some aspects contribute to the positive work home interaction as well, to, as well which actually reduce the stress. For example, having domestic help, having uh, facilities at home, such as techno technological devices, as well as um, uh, infrastructure where you can actually have separate uh, work system. A uh, problem solving approach based uh, strategies were also uh, reported to have been seen as per the research researches, previous researches in during COVID-19. So the objectives for my research was to explore the work home interaction and home to work interaction and their qualities, which is positive and negative of university teachers teaching remotely. Second was to identify how work home interaction is contributing to the stress of university teachers teaching remotely. Thirdly, to explore the coping strategies being used by university teachers teaching remotely in order to counter the challenges of work home interaction. Fourthly, to identify the coping strategies teachers are using for stress. There were three hypotheses. Firstly, there is a significant negative relationship between years of teaching uh, experience and stress. Second hypothesis was that there is, a, uh, there is a significant positive relationship between the hours of teaching and stress. Thirdly, female teachers have significantly higher stress than male teachers. My research questions were, how to uh, how is remote teaching affecting the work home interaction of university teachers? Secondly, how is work home interaction contributing to stress in teachers? For, thirdly, how um, are teachers coping with work home interaction? And fourthly, how coping strategies are uh, coping strategies teachers are using to deal with stress. 
So methodology, it was mixed method research. So the first one was the qualitative, uh, quantitative part, which had a questionnaire, which was perceived stress scale. And then there was a demographic form. The sample was taken through purposive sampling. 40 teachers were taken uh, from a university. There were permanent faculty members, female and male, basically teaching theoretical case, uh, uh, theoretical based courses more. They had minimum experience of two years and currently teaching remotely at um, an institution in Lahore. The procedure was they were basically approached by emails and uh, then further uh, based on their stress level teachers were actually uh, taken three from the highest three teachers who had highest score in the quality uh, in the perceived stress scale and three teachers with the lowest uh, scores. These were taken for the second round, which were the qualitative uh, research in which there were questions asked from teachers regarding their work from interaction and coping strategies. So this was a semi-structured interview done over Zoom. So the results basic of the quantitative part basically showed that there was no relationship between uh, the teaching experience and stress of the teacher as in years of teaching experience. Second, there was another, which basically tells that our hypothesis one was rejected. Hypothesis two was rejected too, as there was no significant correlation between the hours of teaching and stress. And thirdly, yes, there was a significant relationship between uh, female teachers having higher stress um, than male teachers. Overall, we can see that the stress, overall the stress level was seen to be at average. However, the qualitative part basically showed our work to home interaction, home to work interaction and coping strategies as per listed below as uh, home work to home interaction showed the time related increased workload taking a uh, family uh, taking uh, care of the family, work home boundary fusion, family time, uh, there was children and family related, as well as financial saving time and support from the university. Then there was home to work interaction, which basically had resources at home, uh, uh, par parenthood, there was a house chores, children support, family support. Then in coping strategies, moreover, there were uh, problem solving uh, coping strategies, which also included that um, uh, instrumental support, uh, technological devices, having technological devices, buying them, or sometimes even struggling with it, which would have contributed to increasing the stress. So summarizing the qualitative phase, there were both positive as well as negative work home interaction when we were talking about work to home interaction and home to work interaction. So there were few uh, negative as well as positive as per earlier mentioned. Some initially, it, some teachers actually said that initially they did experience negative home to work interaction. However, over time, as they acquired the factors contributing to negative home to work interaction that actually uh, uh, shifted to positive work home interaction. Similarly, as you can see that taking care of the family, as, they, um, as the teachers were initially struggling with uh, managing everything, managing the family care as well, when they eventually had help of the grandparents for the children and everything, so the family care actually uh, proposed as a positive factor to them, which was once a negative. And similar goes with house chores. If you see on the work to home interaction when there were domestic help, that actually turned out to be a positive home to work interaction as at home, the teachers were more stress-free regarding their work at home. So there were uh, a lot of uh, subcategories to, sim uh, to uh, some categories which were experienced positively as some and negatively as some as per I previously explained by with the examples as well. So overall, uh, presently, like after years, uh, positive work home interaction was observed. However, when we talk about coping strategies, moreover, problem solved coping strategies were seen with the support of the family members, some help from the university, changes in the home and working style. They basically learned to adopt to remote teaching, continued learning new ways of teaching, dealing with children, and even handle the house responsibilities. Overall, if you see the work home interaction and coping strategies seem to improve over time. When we talk about, uh, so um, as per previously mentioned, the hypothesis, the first hypothesis was rejected and similar results were seen in some more researches as well, as Abid also seen in 2021. As Pakistan did not have, does not have lots of uh, technological devices and so on and so forth, the facilities as well. So years of teaching was not much of a contributing factor to uh, reducing stress. 
So there was no relationship that could have been seen. Next was our second hypothesis, which was that there was a relationship between stress and hours of teaching. However, that was also rejected as no relationship was seen. Similar results, uh, similar discussion was shown by a German research, which basically said that lesser than four hours of um, teaching per day basically uh, contributes to lesser stress. And the teachers that we had taken had majority of them had three hours of teaching or even less. However, thirdly, female teachers did have significantly higher stress than male teachers, which actually accepted our hypothesis. Then basically, when we talk about stress and negative work home interaction, there were many researchers which basically support as there was an imbalance between the demands and the resources initially. There was time boundary maintenance issues, domestic help, role conflict, growing demands of work and home, lack of administrative help, and so on and so forth, which basically contributed to negative um, um, uh, work home interaction causing stress. But when we talk about the aspects to the positive work home interaction, the support from the administration, proper resources, domestic helpers, spending time with the family, financial stability, support uh, of others um, in domestic as well as work related um, areas, having uh, instrumental support, having opportunities to recover and engage in family time and pleasure basically, leisure basically increased. Um, decrease their stress and increased their uh, uh, their leisure time as well, which actually contributed in directly contributed in reducing the stress. However, overall, if we see solving uh, approach based uh, strategies were used by the teachers, acceptance, active coping and planning were the most which were used by the teachers. And all this is also supported by the researches conducted during COVID-19. As per the conclusion, no significant relationship was seen in the years of uh, teaching experience and hours of teaching. Female teachers has significantly higher stress than male teachers. Three main areas which were seen were work home, work to home interaction, home to work interaction, and coping. So as per I have also explained in the discussion, the implementations uh, implications you can see is contribute uh, contribute to existing literature, especially in a developing country like Pakistan. Contribute uh, to the research on the experience of the teachers regarding the work home interaction and coping strategies. It can be helpful to uh, design. Sorry the, to interrupt you. Your time is almost over. Please yeah, this is the last slide. Yes. Okay, so it will be helpful in designing the academic uh, schedules and programs and helping in training for the teachers for the smoother transition. And the limitations were that the data was uh, data should be collected from the multiple uh, universities as the, there was COVID-19, so we could not really access a lot of universities universities and we can also do longitudinal research as we have seen uh, changes in uh, stress and work home interaction over the years uh, over the two years so thank you so much this was my research thank you for listening to it thank you Manu. Uh, thank you. Uh, our next presenter is dr azra batul uh, dr Azrabatul, are you there now yes i'm here Okay, and her research uh, topic is the enigma of low production in agricultural sector, the solution through trajectory of women's empowerment. Okay. Yeah. Yes, assalamu alaikum and good afternoon, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Nice Wa to see uh, everyone here. This is good. So I should start my presentation because the time is always uh, running short. So I started. Uh, the topic of my presentation is the enigma of low production in agriculture sector, the solution through trajectory of women's empowerment. Uh, my co-author is my sister, Dr. Shahida Batul and Dr. Sarvajit Kaur and uh, from Canberra University and Akhtar Abbas, uh, one of the uh, MPhil students. Uh, so I start from the introduction. As we know that Pakistan is basically agri agrarian country and agriculture is the, the backbone of Pakistan economy and five major crops, uh, cotton, rice, wheat, sugar, and maize are grown here which cover the maximum cultivated area of Pakistan. And the total cultivated area of Pakistan is about 21.5 million uh, hectare, wherein 3.5 million, that is 14.5%, consist of cotton alone. The, this is 
you may say this is the largest part of cash crop after wheat. Uh, this is a figure given by government of Pakistan. Although the problem of low agriculture productivity and productivity means the output to input ratio is common phenomena in developing economies. Pakistan records lower productivity as compared to many other developing countries and neighbors. It is pathetic that though women actively participate in agriculture labor force are not empowered enough and miss the control over their own earned agricultural income, purchase and sale of input and output and in decision making. Their disempowerment enumerates uh, one additional constraint of low farm productivity in the country, although with several other factors, along with many other factors to address the issue of low farm productivity, if women are empowered in agriculture sector of Pakistan, many allied issues can also be settled automatically. Farm productivity is the ratio of output to input used in agriculture sector. In other words, more agriculture output means the farm is more productive. Farm productivity in agriculture sector is found to be positively related with women's environment. And this is manifested in different uh, researches. And uh, one of the research uh, accomplished by Dero et al. 2018, this showed that women's empowerment caused maize production in Western Kenya to rise. Although when gone through the literature, it was found that uh, no study like the present study being conducted in the past, because this is unique in the sense it, it, it involves the uh, composite women empowerment uh, related to agriculture sector. And uh, Batuz and Batul 2018 composite empowerment index was more modified uh, according to the uh, uh, need of the agriculture sector empowerment. And the objective of the study was to empirically investigate the relationship of women's empowerment with farm production in Khanewal district of Punjab, Pakistan. It is uh, necessary to mention here that we have not taken productivity rather we have taken the production because productivity uh, needed the input uh, cost and uh, it was very hard for the rural people to take, to keep the records of their inputs. That is why they had no uh, proper uh, answers to this question. So we decided to take the production rather than the productivity. So the method used uh, was a sampling method was uh, quite simple. This is mixed sampling technique. And uh, at the first day, the province Punjab was purposively selected. And then the four provinces of, uh, out of the four provinces of Pakistan, Khanewal district was randomly selected. Then the disproportionate sample was recruited from Khanewal district of South Punjab, uh, which had uh, four, which has four tassils like Kabirwala, Miachan, Jahania, and Khanewal. Khanewal is a Greek Cultural district and rice and wheat and cotton are main crops in this area. But we took the cotton crop to measure the role of women empowerment in cotton productivity. The targeted sample was women aged uh, 21 to 55 and uh, below 20 was not recruited because their empowerment was not uh, 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 seen to be viable and above 55 women were not uh, working in the fields due to their old age and uh, some sort of illness. So the mayors, all the mayors used in uh, what Urdu be, uh, being the national language, in order to measure the dependent variable farm production, we categorize it in low production, less than five months per acre and moderate, factor, moderate production 15 to 13 and high level of production, 30 to 45 months per acre. Composite women empowerment tax that was modified according to the need of agriculture sector. And the research question was, uh, does women empowerment play a role for the, uh, does women empowerment relate for women to increase their farm production? And this uh, diagram shows the conceptual model 
uh, which tells us there are different variable like technology, training in agriculture sector, agriculture information, farm ownership, women's empowerment, women's age, women's education, and their paid job at the same time, which are going to affect the farm production. Now this table shows the results and, uh, and we have to discuss uh, briefly because uh, here we see that the variables, different technologies used uh, came out to be significant determinant of uh, farm production because the more technology one farm uses, the more production is apt to be taken. Information means agriculture information. If a woman farmer was well aware of the information, the latest technique, the other seed and other inputs, uh, uh, she was uh, found to be more empowered. And similarly, farm uh, production, farm ownership also showed high production because if a person has his own, his or her own farm, uh, his interest to grow more uh, is always uh, uh, welcome. And similarly, women empowerment came out to be highly significant and the women's job was also significant and training was also significant. So now we come to the conclusion. The present study was conducted to assess the role of women empowerment in farm production along with other variables and women empowerment, the focused variable came out to significantly affect production in Carnival district along with technology used, information used in ownership, farm ownership, paid job and training. So the more important part of the study was some policy implications that what should be the suggestions or recommendation to the government and the stakeholders. So the policy implication included that the government of Pakistan should take steps to promote awareness among women and provide uh, adequate facilities to them to increase the farm production. The government should plan to train and educate and provide agriculture information to farmer women to make them competitive in the uh, agriculture market. The latest technology should be introduced in the rural areas where women farmers cannot afford to purchase expensive machineries. The government should subsidize them in agriculture tools such as laser, leveling, deep water system, harvester, and other modern equipment. The NGOs should also create an awareness among the women uh, farmer and they should be uh, apprised that how important their role can be in increasing the farm production for the economy. In this way, the, if the women will be empowered, it is a guarantee that the agriculture production will increase and agriculture production has a major share in the GDP. The GDP will increase, the GDP per capita will increase and up to the, to the grassroots level, the economy can develop. So this is one of the most important thing that 50% of population is uh, women and uh, more of the women live in agriculture area, uh, in the rural areas, and they should be empowered so that we should reap the fruit of the development of the economy. So thank you very much for listening. If any question, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sayyid Azra Batul. Uh, now the question and answer session is open for all. If anybody have any questions with the presenters, you can ask. I think so, there is no question. Uh, so uh, now I formally uh, welcome Madam uh, Dr. Tara Shahid uh, for your insight regarding all these presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Because she is on screen. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much. And all the organizers. Uh, can you hear me well? Because my screen is showing that my voice yes, we can, is we can hear not stable. We can hear you. Okay, so I, I actually I had uh, a few questions for the presenters, especially 
um, and uh, some very interesting presentations have been made in this session and uh, a variety of subjects. And the last topping was Dr. Azra's uh, presentation because uh, within this domain of gender, health and well-being, she added another dimension of women empowerment and a new trajectory that she has suggested. And I think it, it can be called the route to revolution, I thought, Dr. Azra. So Thank if, any, if uh, the policymakers adopt, adopt this route, that will take them to a revolution, maybe. So a very interesting study was presented by Sundas in the beginning, uh, and especially touching on a very sensitive issue, I feel, of self-stigmatization. You know, stigmatization uh, by others is there, but self-stigmatization, it is even more um, sensitive, I would say, and we need to look into it and we need to uh, make people realize that uh, they are not doing, they're not being nice to themselves actually when they start believing like that. Uh, Habza Sana talked about, and I have a question for actually uh, Sana. Uh, if she is she there? Because he talked about the effect, the negative effect of uh, chemicals or maybe pollution. Uh, uh, he was the first presenter you are asking about. No, no. So this was self stigmatization. Professor yeah. Sana talked about, and this is this is an article by uh, Dr. Arpa and Dr. Shella and other people. And actually, somebody else yes, had to present, yes. and then Hafiza Sana presented. Yes. It was about Hafiza, the are you good? PM 2.5 on, uh, on the lung capacity of women in Kasul. So if she's not there, then it's all right. I just wanted to know that there, how, did they, how did they ensure that the effect was only because of an exposure to PM uh, 2.5. So maybe I missed that part in the analysis. I'm sure they must have done it. And uh, then Taibas, yeah, also touched on a very important issue when we are talking about COVID and its effects. Uh, we are talking about the psychological effects that people had, the loneliness that people had, or the healthcare providers, uh, the um, situations and circumstances that we face. So a very important segment of the population is an expecting mother, for example. So how they were deprived of the facilities that they required during the nine months of their pregnancy and they could not receive it because of the prevailing circumstances due to COVID and the availability and non-availability of the facilities to the medical staff, like the PPEs were not available. And I uh, I don't know if Saiba Zia is here or not. And I would like to ask her. Uh, Eba, uh, can you hear? You are here. Uh, she's, she's, uh, I, I think she's there. Eba? Okay. So Taiba, I just, I just wanted to know that you said that the PPEs and other facilities were not available to the doctors uh, in that time. but. Are uh, those doctors equipped with these facilities even then when the situation in, in normal circumstances also when COVID is not there? Are the hospitals well equipped? Otherwise, yes, yes, sure. Okay, uh, basically, I am uh, actually a, a student of public management and sociology. And I did research on COVID, especially at that moment. I uh, work for that. Uh, uh, I mean, topic. I don't know about other. I mean, uh, in other timings, it would be available or not. But the situation shows that it it would be very um, the, uh, problematic for a, a mother for newborn uh, in rural areas, and especially in the areas of the school because I'm doing a job here and uh, I know that when, uh, when we need a, a, a ambulance there sometimes for the students and it is not available, so how can it be possible with that things? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, the traditional uh, birth attendants are very much likely people went there for that and uh, they hesitate to go for doctors, I think. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure because I can't say that because that study was for three months and at uh, that moment it was COVID and I was see seeing and looking at that. 
Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Naipa. And just to wind up, two other very important topics were touched upon, and uh, one is of course uh, the title is very nice: the unsung heroes who were the caregivers, uh, cancer caregivers during the times of COVID. And the, uh, the last topic, which is I'm sure is close to the hearts of all of us, the time and the turmoil and the stress that teachers, university teachers went through during uh, the times of COVID, especially in the first few months after the first lockdown. So it was a testing time. Our technology was testing, it tested our ability to cope with stress was tested, our communication skills were tested, and our ability to meet deadlines and to be there on screen was tested. So the first three months, and maybe six months for some people, had been really tough. But uh, at the end of the day, today we feel all of us are perhaps equipped so it was a testing time maybe that we actually required. So thank you very much organizers. Um, um, I can see Dr. Subha and- uh, Indeed, Miriam that was a testing screen. time and that was a very interesting yeah. finding when the teachers actually referred to and then yes. they said that uh, initially we were very much stressed but over time we are well equipped and now even teachers, this was very uh, interesting when the teachers said that now we would like to go with the hybrid session which is sometimes coming uh, to the university and sometimes taking the online sessions that was a very interesting finding that the teachers yes, are very comfortable yes. enough now so I, I, often, I, often, I often tell my students that it had, it had been a difficult time for you but you don't know uh, how it was uh, for your teachers indeed so, it was and, a very interesting uh, good, research uh, uh, th yes, thank you, uh, Mahanur, and uh, thank you, Dr. Rui Khalid, also, who is your supervisor. So, Indeed, thank, thank you. you very much, organizers. Thank you very, um, thank you very much, much uh, Dr. Con Sarah. Congratulations, once, once again, congratulations on this. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, ma'am, again, uh, for your uh, constructive remarks regarding the presentation. Uh, now I would like attend, I will request Dr. Usma Ashik Khan in charge of gender and development studies, Lahore College of University to for the thinking. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm highly thankful to all the uh, organizers of this conference uh, for conducting such a wonderful uh, online and some sessions physical in first international virtual conference on gender and social science diversity challenges and opportunities. It's a big contribution uh, from uh, FCCU and LCWU uh, to make this uh, event successful. I am highly thankful to patron in chief, Professor Dr. Bushra Mirza, Vice Chancellor, Lahore College for Women University, I'm highly thankful Dr. Jonathan S. Adelton, Rector, Foreman Christian College, FCCU, co-patron in chief of this conference, Dr. Douglas Tremble, Vice Rector for Academic Affairs, FCCU, and uh, Professor Dr. Muhammad Afzal, Dean Arts and Social Science, Lahore College for Women University, uh, Dr. Sikandar Hayat, Dean Social Science, Foreman's Christian College at the uh, FCCU. And uh, this conference, in this conference, we had uh, more than 60 research papers from different disciplines, uh, uh, gender studies, sociology, and uh, lots of other areas. People from uh, civil society, from academia participated in this workshop. I am highly thankful to the chief organizer, Dr. Subha Malik. Uh, for this conference and uh, for all the support and uh, Dr. Professor Dr. Sara Shahid, Professor of Psychology uh, for Men Christian College University. Thank you, Dr. Sara Shahid, from your support always. Whenever we uh, you, invite you and discuss something, you are always so supportive. I'm also thankful to Dr. Shaila Ahmed, Ms. Mamuna Riaz, organizers of this conference, Dr. Sunil Samuel from FCCU, and uh, we had uh, two keynote speakers in during this workshops, Dr. Ani Gamad and Dr. Maria Fennin. We are highly thankful to them. And uh, we are thankful to Kathleen Glavisco, Chief of the Political Economic Section at U.S. Consulate General Lahore. Thank you, Kathleen, and the IT Department and Mass Communication Department. And in the last very important person, uh, Mr. Sharam Niazi, 
who uh, bear our uh, delay responses every time and he is so cooperative and facilitate us thank you mr sharam niazi always thank you all for this participation and uh, thank you fccu once again this is all from my side thank you thank you thank you very much thank you very much dr uh, now uh, dr subha malik is also with us she is uh, Uh, she is the chief organizer of the conference and team lead of the project under which this conference is being held. I refer to Dr. Subha Malik uh, for sharing her remarks. I just want to conclude the session by uh, uh, the same thanking everybody, and also I hope that this conference is able to bridge the gap between scholars and researchers and faculty members. because all of them came and you know presented their work so i hope this is helpful to everybody thank you very much and hope i hope that we are able to have these kind of forums soon uh, and more often so that we can all contribute our work and uh, meet everybody virtually as well as physically thank you Uh, thanks again uh, for all the participants for joining today and uh, even the presenters uh, thank you very much Thank you.